So good afternoon, distinguished speakers, uh, colleagues and guests. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon to Canberra, um, in Canberra, to especially welcome the 2016 World Food Prize Laureate, Dr. Howard Lewis. So biofortification is simply the process of taking high yielding varieties of crops and then finding varieties that are either high in iron or high in zinc or high in vitamin A and crossing the two using just regular plant breeding. Eventually uh, you, you come out with a high yielding, high iron or high zinc or high vitamin A variety. So for 30 years the World Food Prize has recognized and celebrated outstanding individuals who've contributed to the cause of food security and nutrition around the world. Poor people eat a lot of food staples and they get, usually get enough energy to keep from going hungry from the food staples. They would love to eat more vegetables, more fruits, lentils, animal products, fish. They just can't afford it. And those are the parts of the diets that are high in minerals and vitamins. But because they can't afford it, they're deficient in these, in these uh, minerals and vitamins. So biofortification is a way to put them in the foods that they're already eating. Uh, the numbers were just staggering. I mean, there's 30 million deaths a year. In fact, it's the number one leading cause of death, malnutrition globally, five times more than any other cause of death. One of my main messages today is to, is to say, and you'll hear from my Australian colleagues about how important the success of Harvest Plus can be attributed to the uh, participation of Australian scientists. They've been central to our work from the beginning. What we are asking farmers to do is substitute one for one. If they're growing a non-biofortified maize or a non-biofortified rice, we're multiplying seeds and through various channels we're making them available to farmers. And so if they're, and the cost is the same. So if they're buying a seed of a particular crop, buy a biofortified seed instead. The production techniques are just the same. Harvest Plus started in 1993 when Howard Lewis showed up in my laboratory at Cornell University and asked the question, can crops fortify themselves? And I answered yes. And oh, by the way, it also it improves yield. Uh, we focused on rice, wheat, maize, cassava, those are the four uh, main food staples concerned around the world. Also we've invested in sweet potato and uh, pearl millet. So we've released biofortified crops now in 30 countries around the world and they're in, in multi-location testing or in for, the, the, for release in 25 other countries. These crops that they're developing have got this, these built-in uh, properties, agronomic properties, that make it worthwhile for farmers to grow. And supported by Asia and Harvest Plus, we introduced seven orange flesh varieties uh, to the Solomons, supplied by the International Potato Centre, SIP, in Peru. This particular one's called the Beauregard. It's uh, high in beta carotene, pro vitamin A, it yields well, it uh, tastes good, it's climatically adaptable, and it's now widespread in the solids. It's also very popular here in Australia. Certainly the work that we're doing on the ground is trying to link nutrition and agriculture um, arms, I guess, of the World Vision Beast together. Um, and you know, that's a, a journey in itself, but one that, that we're committed to making. Um, but certainly, the Australian Aid Program has a focus on nutrition sensitive agriculture as well, and so I think this is a, a really important tool in helping to drive that forward. I think the main challenge is when we put pro-vitamin A in a crop. Um, it changes the color, so Africans eat white maize, but our high vitamin A maize is orange. So if you, if you don't give them any information about why it's orange, they're naturally not going to switch. So you have to tell the mothers, the price of this orange maize is the same as the white maize, and you'll protect your family from vitamin A deficiency. Why don't you buy the orange maize? What well, continues to happen today, really, and that is a major focus on providing plant breeders with the tools required to breed for uh, improved nutrition of the staple food crops. 
first of all, high iron rice. Uh, rice has the lowest iron concentration of all of the major cereals. Uh, when you mill that grain to make white rice, you usually only have about two parts per million iron in the grain. To make a measurable impact on the human diet, if you want to biofortify that grain, you need to be much higher than about 14 parts per million iron. Uh, so conventional breeding hasn't been able to do that. Uh, what we started doing in 2007, 2008, is looking at how plants absorb iron from the soil, how, how rice absorbs iron from the soil. We identified some key genes involved in that process, and we used genetic modification to turn those genes on higher. One of the best investments that can be made in is in agricultural research. I'll just give an example from biofortification. Vitamin A capsules have been shown to reduce infant mortality by 23%. So they're a great investment, but it costs a dollar per capsule to give it away. Only two or three cents to manufacture, but you need a, a, a network of people and a system to distribute the capsules once every six months, and that costs a dollar. There are 500 million capsules given out each year, so $500 million is spent. It's a good investment. But then next year you do the same thing. Over a decade you've spent five billion dollars and you've done nothing to address the underlying cause. Well, with just a fraction of five billion dollars you can do the agriculture research to put the vitamin A, get the plants to do the work of synthesizing the vitamin A. One point that um, I wonder about is how strongly can you marshal the power of profit? In the private sector. I mean, you did touch on that quite a bit about the returns to the farmers and the they can sell their produce. But if you're going to go beyond 2030, clearly we have to think about sources of funding other than government for that. And, and the private sector is probably the best, best one we have. What advice would you give to young researchers today who are trying to push the boundaries of science and, and agriculture? What advice would you and the rest of the panel give to them who are wanting to push these boundaries and think more innovatively about these challenges? You have to take calculated risks. Uh, you know, life, that's, that's what I, life is all about, is taking chances, taking risks, and the rewards are high. If I were talking to a young scientist, I'd say, well, what do you want your uh, career to do? How he said, if you want to have large impact, uh, you'll think about what's the most important things to work on in agriculture. And if the number one killer in the world is malnutrition, then you can make a contribution to lowering that uh, amount of debt to things that agriculture is doing. I think that's a pretty important thing to do. Why am I so passionate about this? Well, you see the terrible consequences of, of vitamin A deficiency, uh, the mortality rates being so high. Iron deficiency causes uh, lower cognitive abilities when children suffer from that when they're very young. It can't be reversed. 450,000 deaths are caused by zinc deficiency alone. Um, and I see that agriculture and plant breeding can have a major impact on that, very cost efficiently. I'm an economist by training, so I love, I love to see those efficiencies. So when you, when you see that you can use science uh, to help these people, um, you know, you want to do everything that you can.